welcome everyone. So it's it's so exciting to be here, even in a digital window, Tulane School of Architecture digital Zoom lecture. So this is it is my pleasure today to present uh, this second one of a series of the fall semester Tulane School of Architecture lecture series. So the lecture committee formed by a series of, of faculty here at the School of Architecture met last spring and fall and uh, composed by Richard Campanella, Kerry Norman, Sonsoles Vela, Cordula Roser, and two students, Kat Tomisato and Madison Cook. And we, we met during the, the, the semester and discussed the appropriateness of uh, a lecture format whose goal, main, main goal is to engage conversation and conversation across across fields of knowledge and across constituencies, faculty and students, etc. And the umbrella of, of theme is human inhabitation. So the first on the series we had last week was uh, the title human inhabitation and equity and with uh, three panelists also like today. And we had uh, Edson Cabalfin with a, a PhD in history and architecture and urban development from Cornell University and also the director uh, of a uh, SICE program here. So again, uh, looking for um, uh, scholars that are crossing several boundaries. We also had on that triad, uh, uh, triad uh, Carol Rees, Fabric Professor of Architecture, Historian and Director of the City, Culture and Community uh, PhD program here. And Chris Christopher Oliver, a uh, Glazer Professor of Social Entrepreneurship and at the Taylor Center also at Tulane. So we had uh, this amazing lecture and I'm calling that because I think it's important that students also recall the fact that they can tap into this lecture and see it again as the, as, uh, the one of today that is going to be recorded. So the panel discussed neoliberal city taking some case studies in the Philippines revealing for students the spatial implications of urban transformation under neoliberal policies. So that was a critical window for, of a city model that um, I know many students at the School of Architecture uh, enjoyed and can keep enjoying looking at uh, the recorded piece. So for the second lecture, the overarching theme is human inhabitation and climate change with a specific title of climate core towards uh, a common climate change curriculum in the built environment. And it is my pleasure to present the three stellar guests we have here today, coming from first, uh, from far, from far to, to, to near. Uh, first, Mark Norman, welcome. Uh, our guest is uh, coming from Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan, Associate Professor of Practice. And Norman operates at the at, uh, as an urban planner at the intersection of development, finance, design, planning, and cultural programming throughout, throughout the country. And he's educated at the University of California with a master's in urban planning and at the University of California, Berkeley with a bachelor uh, in arts in political economy. And also spent some a year in, in, in France, in Lyon, in, uh, in the school of uh, Institute of, of Political Studies. So then, uh, welcome again. We have Torb, Torb John Tornqvist. I don't know how to pronounce that because I always Good. call you Tor. Uh, is our second guest uh, today. It's coming from the School of Science and Engineering. It's a Vogue's geology professor. Tor's research interests include quaternary geology, sea level change, coastal sustainability, fluvial delta sedimentology, sequence stratigraphy, applied uh, geochronology, and is educated as a physical geograph in a physical geography major with a PhD on the Holocene evolution of fluvial uh, delta river in the Netherlands. And arrives that I think it's an important thing to remember that it, it arrives, he arrives at, uh, New Orleans in 2005, just three days before Katrina hit the land, and that makes a huge uh, mark on, on the curriculum. Third, and our main guest today, our esteemed new colleague at the School of Architecture, Associate Professor of Real Estate, Jesse Keenan, whose fields of expertise are in real estate and infrastructure, climate change adaptation, 
building science and economics, economical finance, environmental finance, federal, state, local climate policy and housing studies. His education is, it, is it, uh, holding uh, degrees in law, real estate and the built environment. So welcome uh, the three of you. I, I just wanted to, to say also that uh, because we're crossing fields of knowledge and we all speak a different jargon, I, I want just to ask you a little bit of, of patience uh, and uh, encourage the participants to, to make questions even though the vocabulary may be not, it's not matching most, most of the time. So uh, don't get fear of getting wrong, <laughs> the wrong question or wrong vocabulary or the wrong uh, uh, direction. I think it's important to know that because we're in different fields, we talk different jargons and, and, and that's fine. So that being said, uh, I'm going to manage uh, the, the chat. Uh, attendees, if you can just uh, throw the questions as, you, as we move on and at the end, we'll, we'll uh, catch them and, and share them with everyone. Welcome, is, the floor is yours, Jesse. Well, thank you very much for having me and thank you uh, to all of you uh, for joining uh, uh, this lecture today and thank you to our respondents, Margarita and really everybody. It's a Monday afternoon uh, and evening and so I know that it's sometimes difficult for us to come together under such circumstances after a long day. So I wanted to talk today about uh, Climate Core towards a common, common climate change curriculum in the built environment. I assume everybody can see my slides okay at this point. Everybody can see the slides okay? Yep, okay, good. Yeah. So the premise here is twofold. One is that we have, we need a climate educated labor force in all sectors of our economy. Nearly every economic sector, we have challenges um, with internalizing expertise and competency as it relates to climate change. Um, you name it, we can talk about how these are both calibration of existing skills in the sense that people are engaged in economic processes and are part of a labor force doing certain things and the production of goods and services. And we must calibrate that work, if you will, and that labor uh, to climate change competency and understanding uh, a wide variety of things that we're gonna talk about today, but it also is new forms of analysis and production, right? So there's an expansive component of this um, that is really uh, opportunistic in a way. And I bring this, project this idea of climate and labor and education, not as um, a, a projection of a moral foundation from which there is an immoral philosophical or ethical appeal. Rather, it's one of a recognition of facts and the facts associated with a broad set of considerations relating to climate change. But indeed, we think about climate change as a component of global change and, and in many ways, uh, when you begin to study and understand these things, you can't disaggregate their relationships. And for here, for our conversation today, or at least this evening, we can think about global, uh, global change as being uh, made up of a, a, a slew of different challenges, climate change, racial, social, and economic inequality, uh, loss of biological diversity, which is a significant uh, challenge uh, in terms of ecosystem services, of course, uh, unsustainable resource use, and certainly that hits home within the built environment as extractive economies uh, and being a component of that. Water and food scarcity, aging society, the change, the programmatic change of how we think about everything from housing life cycling uh, to the material orientation to extended uh, and aging societies. Uh, changing human labor, of which this is a major and material component. Um, the rate of technological change, our capacity to adapt at a certain speed to all of these things is very much, I would argue, beyond our initial or in current capacities in higher education. The idea that we're caught in perpetual hybrid warfare and we are likely to be so in, in the future and ultimately artificial intelligence. So all of these things are components of global change from which climate change is one uh, component that we will draw upon. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we need to teach about climate change? Um, and I would ask maybe a more precise question, which is what skills do students fundamentally need within this broader context of both climate change and global change? So 
When you're studying climate change, you of course have to understand the nature and philosophy of science and scientific methods. You have to understand the uh, empirical orientation to climate science, observational climate science, both in the manifestation of everything from radiant forcing to ocean uh, uh, coastal dynamics, uh, as well as climate impacts, first and second order impacts. We have to understand sustainability science for its strengths and all of its anthropocentric weaknesses, if you will. We have to understand adaptation science, both in its biological, its social, and its applied science manifestations. We have to understand risk in decision science. How do we understand risk as a probabilistic construction and how does that shape our orientation to uh, how we make decisions and resource allocations? We have to understand disaster risk reduction and allied field and uh, consideration to this associated with material and structural and sometimes non-structural interventions that help manage and reduce risk. We have to understand not only environmental science, but how that science is then translated to policy and action at multiple different scales, both formal and informal associated with governance and management, as well as legacy notions of environmental regulation. We have to understand ecosystem services. And here we have to understand the units of analysis of ecology, both in systematic and non-systematic terms, and how we therefore also account for ecosystem services? How does that drive our uh, uh, more formal decision-making within the built environment? Of course, by extension, we have to understand land use. All of all global terrestrial land use uh, infrastructure and urbanization represent only 1%. Yes, it has, yet it has a totalizing impact on the range of associated land uses. I believe something like only 9% of uh, terrestrial uh, component of earth is uh, uh, un managed uh, directly or somewhat indirectly by mankind. Uh, environmental design, both as a technological but as a behavioral component. Um, and in that regard, we also have to understand the relationship between energy and economy. The idea that fossil fuels and the energy economies that drove things like democracy, the extent to which there are uh, negative and positive manifestations of carbon and a carbon footprint and what that means in terms of these broader net zero transitions. Who are the winners and losers? How are we intrinsically tied? Because when you see these connections, these flows of energy and flows of capital, you begin to understand pathways for sustainable uh, uh, net zero transition. Uh, we have to understand climate governance, how it is that we come together to solve problems on not just formal policy mechanisms, but over a wide variety of um, uh, global, transnational, and even very localized notions of governance. Uh, and of course, the implications here uh, and the impacts associated with public health and other determinants and indicators that um, speak to environmental and social welfare, including um, broader aspects of human health. So all of this results into our capacity to work in inter inter interdisciplinary and sometimes transdisciplinary teams. How do we build consensus and how do we understand that within the context of justice, particularly procedural justice and distributional equity? So we have all of these things that we study with climate change, these major fields of study, but I again come back to this idea of skills. I think where we're heading and where I'd like to head with this lecture is ultimately a syllabus or two that thinks synthetically and builds upon this moment of where we think about the skill. And so I think we need a basic orientation and this is skills and this is a curriculum within the built environment that bridges uh, architecture, design, urban design, urban planning, real estate and the like. So here, I think we begin with a basic statistical analysis and understanding of inference. Uh, it's a tremendously foundational component, uh, a tremendous foundation from which we have not done a great job, particularly in architectural studies. Uh, we must understand to analyze and manage uncertainty. So not just risk and the probabilistic risk, but how do we deal with uncertainty, deep uncertainty and ultimately ignorance and how we make decisions. We have to understand where to source and where to interpret environmental data. We have to also know the limitations to not just the data, but the modeling itself. We have to be able to responsibly utilize the schism models. So just because we get the data, we source it, and we plug and play, we certainly 
know the limitations, for instance, in architectural discourse in recent years about the generative limitations of parametricism. We've gone through that. It's an age old problem in many ways. But where we are today is more complex decision making about different types of phenomena, including economics, that drive how we think about everything from material optimization to even site and context and social recognition. We have to identify as an analytical exercise, cognitive biases, deterministic logic, normative rationale. We have to separate the descriptive from the normative, which is very often conflated and confounded in broader iterative processes of design, which is critically important. And I don't wanna position this as design science, as a, as a methodology. I wanna position this in interdisciplinary terms that give independence to design in its own iteration of method as method. But I think it's important that we understand the stationarity, not only in the data in the institutions that provide that data, shape that, and give interpretation for us that data, but how that plays out in broader ideas of logic and reason. And drawing those simple distinctions, I think, will go a long way to understanding the fixity and the institutional type of lock-in that face things like, for instance, a net zero transition. We need stress-tested analytical ethics. Professional ethics are no longer going to be in service of what we seek. Professional ethics are those ethics which are in service of the profession itself. It is not necessarily grounded in a superior or pluralistic world of values from which we recognize. We need a capacity to systematize our analysis, to bring in a wide variety of values that are very often site by site specific. There's no universal, and I think, recognition of the universality of these values that I think holds true. Now, there may be some that uh, we wait and reweight in prioritization of progressive orientation to the world, but that's something that I think we can look at through a secularizing lens. Evaluate multiscalar relationships and conflict. We have to know the orientations of both systems and non-systems. We have to understand the empirical limits, the units of analysis, and we have to be able to move across scale. Design is as good as any other in uh, setting us up for understanding uh, a material, a interpretive, a uh, place and experiential components of scale. But I think we have to think now in ecological terms and certainly one could argue even panarchic terms that brings us into a, a set of cross-scalar uh, relationships for the flow of capital itself. And that's financial, material, uh, environmental capital. We have to understand path dependencies and resource trade-offs. There is no such thing as free resilience or adaptation. Everything is about resource and resource trade-offs, whether that's the resource allocated for construction and material, or it's the resources associated with interventionist policies or uh, in the name of resilience or adaptation. And to that end, we have to understand that the decisions we make today uh, set forth a certain parameter of opportunity uh, and flexibility in the future. Uh, and the critical nature of uh, what we would call path dependency as we move forward. We have to understand designing adaptive processes. So preservation and the conservationist components of, that have dominated um, the discursive elements of monument and uh, projective notions of architecture in its fixed object form, I would argue can be challenged for multi-programmatic, multi-generational orientation. And sometimes that means short useful life. And sometimes that means designing for a very uh, long useful life. And I think that we have to recontextualize useful life and really begin to understand what it means to invest in the adaptive capacity of architecture and buildings itself, as well as the infrastructural adaptive capacity to handle a much broader range of performative uh, parameters, if you will. Um, in that sense, we pick up where we have Current, our current strengths in terms of life cycle and energy analysis to extend that to a carbon equivalent footprint and understand a broader realm of impact. And so in this regard, we have a tremendous foundation uh, to build upon. But the, at the end of the day, the challenge, particularly for architecture is to put a price on carbon in the process of our design. Uh, we have to then, through extension of these analyses with greater and uh, degrees of sophistication, we can uh, debate uh, in its relevance and application we can debate, but ultimately this leads us to optimization of material choices and even site 
location and choices, which is very often goes under the radar. And ultimately this leads us, if the idea is to train people to work, particularly in interdisciplinary teams uh, with different modes of specialization, to be, to be creative and to be able to communicate and clearly communicate. All of this is just a huge range of skills. And many of these skills are already in our curriculum in different ways. But I think these are the skills that we can look at climate change and we can look at the speed, the speed of, of change and the rate of change and the depth of change association associated with climate change and global change. And we can understand these are the skills that we need. And they come through us through different disciplinary foundations and interdisciplinary foundations. So if we step back and we think about the human environment and we think about various themes that reflect our relationship between uh, human engagement and environment, we can think about suitability, conservation, sustainability, climate mitigation, and climate adaptation. And suitability speaks to the fitness of humans and our interaction with the environment and where we make locational decisions and preferences. And we drive sociocultural values in our orientation of that fitness and that suitability. We can think about conservation and the conservation of the aggregation of resources and capital that we have accumulated. And by extension, we can think of that in a broader scale of perpetuity associated with sustainability, or at least the ambition associated with consumption, consumerism, and how we manage that uh, for its strengths and weaknesses. And of course, climate mitigation and climate adaptation, prevention of GHG and responses and preparations for climate change impact. So let's take a very simple idea of resilience in its broadest manifestation in current scholarly discourse. So we can break up climate change in, in a uh, field of study associated with climate mitigation and climate adaptation, this you recognize. But we also have to understand that resilience actually fits in a broader realm of the science of climate adaptation. Um, both resilience and resilience pathways, which are sort of vernacular of the IPCC, as well as transformative adaptation and adaptive capacity. But resilience itself actually has a tremendous epistemological diversity. We can think about engineering resilience, which has a, uh, an elasticity to the operations of the status quo, a very quite conservative uh, uh, operation of conversion uh, and response. Um, to other more uh, uh, amorphous ideas of, let's say, community resilience, um, which have a multi-equilibrium capacity, the idea that there are multiple potential stable states. And in this, we have descriptive elements that are truly observational, and then we move to a realm of normativity, how things ought to be. And so in this realm of engineering resilience, ecological resilience, and community resilience, we can understand that we're bringing in a wide variety of disciplinary knowledge that we have to then synthesize. So there's no such thing as resilience. It's multiple different types, as we see here, of categorical resilience. And this requires a broad uh, field of study to understand, for instance, the public health indicators and metrics that drive much of community resilience these days. But you also have to understand the nature of the underlying systematic performance associated with engineering resilience. So here's another simple question that illustrates the challenges that we face, perhaps in interdisciplinary terms. What do we need to know to put a price on carbon in architecture? Well, we have to know a little bit about ge biogeochemical sciences that link materials and carbon cycles. We have to know a little bit about material science that helps us think about optimization and how that plays out in terms of supply chains and our accessibility to these converted resources. We have to know a little bit about economics in terms of project finance and things even such as the social cost of carbon. We have to even get into ideas of accounting and tax policy to understand how we balance and make trade-offs between different types of subsidized technology and how life cycle accounting for buildings and infrastructure actually plays out in accounting terms. This is the logic from which our subversive and perhaps even progressive ambitions associated with climate um, can actually be translated at scale, I would argue. We have to know about historic preservation to understand project alternatives and to understand the ideas of material recycling and continuity and durability. We have to, of course, understand and reflect in architectural history and theory terms the precedent and the alternative notions of ambient 
comfort and thermal controls and performance um, that have guided us through the course of history. So in returning to these sort of typified ideas of suitability, conservation, and the like, we can think that when you're studying the built environment, and here I organize this by material, process, socio-ecological relationships, structure, and land, there's a wide variety, particularly in the undergraduate education, that we can access, a wide variety of um, areas that we can access in terms of environmental studies, historic preservation, ecology, and certainly geography covers a wide range from suitability to adaptation. But the, but the reality is that there's no one field, not even uh, sustainable real estate development or architecture or even landscape architecture that really covers the full spectrum of activity in any one of this. And this is an incomplete uh, uh, matrix here. Um, but I think what I'm trying to illustrate here is the extent to which we, we it's a patchwork. And our accessibility to this knowledge um, comes through a patchwork of our own curriculum design. So here's what I propose, climate core. And I think of this in two ways, environment and society and society and environment. But no registrar in their like mind would ever allow me to name two classes, uh, environment, society, society, environment. It would lead to registration chaos. So what I propose is global change one, environment, and global change two, people. And here's a quick syllabus over a 13 week semester. I would start with the theories of science and understanding where we stand today in terms of the uh, emancipatory ontologies and the theories um, leading to a Kuhnian uh, falsification and all of the ways from which we can understand uh, the, not only the philosophy of science, but the scientific method, as well as the different theories and philosophies associated with the environment from its constructivist to its planetary urbanistic and Gaia orientations. Again, scientific method and data analysis and inference are central uh, to our time and interest here. But again, in terms of formal climate science, we have to spend the time, multiple weeks, as has been my experience in years of teaching climate change, it takes to really get into the full level of details um, that speak to, again, everything from radiant forcing to the carbonization uh, associated with uh, the seas and even as I referenced recently in a Deason article uh, in concrete assemblies themselves. We then can move into uh, more formal studies associated with attribution science and observational uh, science associated with ongoing intelligence and modeling of climate change impact. Not everything uh, by virtue of variability and measurement bias and all of these other things are necessarily attributable to climate change. So we have to be able to understand attribution science when we deal um, with uh, both risk uncertainty and deep uncertainty. Uh, we then, I think, have an opportunity to reflect in the nature of environmental change in anthropological and sociological terms. Um, humans have adapted to climate change before in the eras and epochs of human history. There is something to be learned there. Indeed, ongoing engagements in anthropological and sociological terms uh, are critical and quite rich in our understanding of how people interpret and deal with change. Then this leads us again to climate mitigation, the flows of energy and capital, as I, prior, as I referenced prior. Um, the most, uh, I would argue, uh, ambitious and central component of how we address climate change is stopping the greenhouse gases. But understanding how we are integrally tied, uh, particularly in the built environment, uh, to these flows of energy, carbon, carbon equivalent, and capital are fundamental to our, 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 our studies here. Uh, again, ecosystems and ecosystem services, even as anthropocentric orientations as to a service to humans, we need to understand the boundaries from which this shapes our decision making and shapes our understanding of an alternative and expanded range of values. Right? So the values that we hold today, we can recognize as largely being unsustainable because they are benchmarked to an unsustainable level of consumption. As we think about new values, and those values may be derived in part from ecosystem services, we have new avenues of, uh, of value in our chains and lines of production, particularly in the built environment. And that may mean not building buildings, of course. Uh, and of course, that extends us into land use and environmental management. Again, a certain intensity of time dedicated to the translation of science, governance, and policy. How does science 
translate to these modes of action? What are the instrumentalities here? What is our legacy that we have to understand in terms of uh, environmental regulatory legacies? For instance, one thing I often see in design studios is a huge focus on water and quantity with almost never uh, do you see any orientation to water quality uh, in the management of water in the urban and built form. Uh, not always the case, of course, um, but it's one of these limitations in part because students haven't understood the legacy of what it means to uh, regulate, uh, monitor, monitor and measure uh, environmental uh, water quality, that is. Uh, climate adaptation, of course, understanding the broader fields and applications of categorical resilience, the different types of resilience together with climate adaptation that leads us to transformation and trade-off. So we begin with theories of science and scientific method. We move from climate science itself into these more formal modes of decision-making and translation from science to policy to action that drives our understanding of design and management of the built environment. I see climate change or global change to rather people, the second of these paired uh, core, climate core curriculum is beginning with and standing on a slightly different footprint. So if we go from environment to society, we reverse the polarity here from society to environment. And we think in the start, of course, with the tremendous legacy of environmental justice and where we stand today in climate justice, distinct avenues of, of human organization and a recognition of the marginalization of people and the underlying inequality that shapes uh, all that we do. Of course, this requires dedicated study and understanding of the empirical foundations of racial, social, and economic inequality, and how that shapes and our level of participation uh, of that in uh, constituting and breaking uh, the boundaries of oppression as some uh, may frame it. Design for human health is a critical component of these metrics of how we understand new modes uh, of social welfare and new metrics from which we extend not just sustainable development goals as we've seen in uh, urban application for many years, but new on alternative standards from which we adjudicate uh, environmental and social health and maybe inequality and equality as well. Uh, we also have to think about the nature and relationship between work and education, particularly in the face of artificial intelligence. Again, we're expanding and contextualizing climate change within global change. And so we need to understand these relationships between work and labor. We know, for instance, the tremendous impact that we will have in the United States, or I say we know, we have estimated, we have modeled, and we have studied extensively the extent to which extreme heat, for instance, will be uh, removing, uh, uh, reducing labor productivity, reducing labor output, and having a disproportionate burden uh, on uh, many uh, 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 labor forces who work outside, for instance. So you think about this in terms of inequality, you think about in the climate, these things begin to connect, I think, in very constructive ways. And certainly, certainly one of the avenues, I think, of education, particularly in architecture, is having a more attuned orientation to the burdens that architecture imposes on labor and labor conditions and labor pricing, even internal to the profession itself. Uh, I would argue, which is in a dire situation by some account as to relate to how we value architectural services in general. But I speak more formally in terms of construction and construction industries. Uh, housing, from shelter to rights. Under, I think we have a tremendous foundation for this in our curriculum today in almost every school in the United States. But I think stepping back and thinking more fundamentally about how we make these translations and the extent to which uh, other avenues of global change drive a reorientation uh, to housing and uh, in its wide spectrum of activity. Thinking about anti-displacement and mobility. And we can think about this in the push and pull of demographics and demography. And the push and pull from which people um, create new capital, they lose capital, i.e. social capital sometimes, the extent to which we fight a wide variety of things from homelessness to the ambitions of uh, economic mobility. These things are intricately connected in understanding how we measure that, how we have ongoing intelligence about changing preferences, about changing capacities, about um, underlying geographic and economic variables that shape the push and pull of how and where people 
live and what access they have to a wide variety of goods and services, and ultimately a liberalist idea of their own self-determination to construct identities and lives in their own right. Accessibility and transportation. So again, we extend these coupled ideas of what it means to think about accessibility in terms of education healthcare, and quite literally with transportation, these things can be understood as paired terms. Risk and vulnerability to disaster and our role, particularly in the built environment associated with disaster capitalism. How do we think about vulnerability? How do we move away from simple conflations like poverty and vulnerability? Not all poor are vulnerable as my students have heard a million times. How do we begin to understand this as an ongoing mode of intelligence about uh, understanding the nature of shifting and dynamic vulnerability and adaptive capacity. Of course, we need basic understanding of the patterns and processes and units of analysis associated with urban, eco uh, urban uh, ecology and how that shapes our understanding across scales to things like planetary urbanism. We need a basic understanding of sustainability science and uh, how that lines up with consumption. Because very often we think in perpetual nature of sustainability in its um, self-serving uh, and perpetual nature without understanding that we don't challenge the, the, the fundamentals of consumption in the first place, right? We hold consumption as a static without really fundamentally thinking about this. And of course that leads us to another scale of globalization and the tension between growth and degrowth, which very often does not get enough credit or understanding I think when broader schools of the built environment, because these are macroeconomic considerations, yet they play out in very finite terms in nearly everything that we do. And of course, leading into environmental technology and civic ideals, how do we unitize the world in technological terms and control that as information? The only social system is a system of communication, which is derived in technological terms these days to understand and manifest itself as power and authority and validity in ways that drive not only hybrid warfare, but um, information, misinformation, and the very fundamental notion of truth itself. So how do we think about civic ideals and our relationship to the civic environment, the built environment, and the broader realm of community and public space that we project on upon the world without understanding the technological manifestations of this and the technological orientation that has been internalized in our management and design of the built environment. And finally, as I referenced earlier, the ethics of the built environment, moving from professional ethics and moving into uh, systematized analytical ethics. So how do you sequence climate core? Well, I think about this in terms of lining up uh, the environment or global change one with things like building climate comfort materials. Uh, thinking of this actually by extension as being a lab type science um, and for climate change or global change too, rather people thinking about this, um, really getting this education before you go into advanced elective studios, before you take courses, wonderful courses like design and society, it really begins to um, balance a lab science and a social science, I think in very productive ways that are in dialogue uh, with each other. In a real estate sequence, I would hope that uh, Global Change One could be uh, paired with the building science component, with the introduction to architecture, for instance. Um, but it's something that you um, take concurrent with your other work in finance and economics as you lead into Global Change One to understand these broader aspects of uh, macro and micro economy and in the implications associated with this, not just in a technocratic language, but an understanding of the fundamental humanistic nature of problems and solutions themselves. So I end here and I look very much uh, forward to speaking and hearing from the commentary of the respondents and, uh, and thank you Margarita for hosting us uh, this evening. But I think about global change one and the environment and I think about this transition from science to the applications. What do we do? How do we translate these things? Where do we balance our deterministic logic associated with applied science to those things that are truly creative and at the heart of what design and design methods can do and share in worlds of the built environment. But I think it's also important to step back and understand the humanist orientations here as it relates to matters of justice and equity and ultimately our own internal ethical reflection of where we fit in in this broader world of global change. So thank you very much uh, for having me this evening. It's a great privilege to join all of you and thank you for taking the time and I, I look forward to hearing from everybody tonight. So thank you.
Thank you, Jesse. So the floor is open. Thor, Mark, whenever you want to jump up. Um, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I'm drawn particularly to Jesse's call to identify path dependencies and also to be uh, creative and, and communicate. Um, I think Jesse makes a compelling case for degree programs um, or course sequences rather than putting the onus on a particular class. Um, I think that puts a lot of pressure um, to get a lot of information out, but also be impactful. Um, and that leads me in, in my work um, to spend my time in my courses on certain aspects of elements that aren't necessarily uh, woven into the actual um, subject matter, things like web design, um, programs like InDesign and Photoshop, basic underwriting, um, to make sure that those elements that Jesse talked about um, can be communicated effectively and be creative. Um, in my courses, like public-private partnerships, which I teach this term, um, or disruptions in real estate development, um, I see that students are coming from all different places. And so, you know, the question becomes, how do you link um, those different kinds of expertise um, together to sort of create uh, the whole and, and the things that we saw in his list in, in the syllabi he, he presented. Um, my students, for example, are one third urban planning, about one third um, business, and then the rest a mix of architecture, public policy, and law. So I think it just adds another element to sort of how you bring those different disciplines together and create a coherent um, curriculum. Uh, I don't expect students to come into, into or out of my courses as experts in all the dimensions and problems that we're trying to solve. Um, but I do think if they can speak a variety of languages, understanding the terms of the debate, the critiques, and where innovation might lie, then I, I might chalk that up as a win. Um, I also feel myself using the textbook more and more as a reference source, but not as the primary text. And so I'd be interested to get a sense from Jesse and Tor about sort of how they think about um, we use texts, uh, given the speed of change and the breadth of issues we're confronting. I find myself much more relying on um, guest speakers, podcasts, articles in the popular press, and, and even conference proceedings like these as, as tools. Um, also, thinking about the sort of extracurricular ways that um, students can be brought into this. So things like um, HUD's Innovation and Affordable Housing Competition or the ULI Heinz Competition. Um, and centers. So at Michigan, we have a center of poverty solutions, which has been really uh, instrumental in sort of bringing different students together from different disciplines. Um, I, I also strive and maybe struggle uh, to structure courses that prepare students for this multidisciplinary world. Um, and, you know, acknowledging that they're arriving at my courses with these different skills. Um, but hopefully leaving with a notion of equitable development and sustainable design and economic development. Um, and so I can't, I realize I can't, you know, do all of that. Um, and that it takes collaboration. And um, so I also maybe want to touch on some issues around sort of how these things are organized uh, inside and outside of the classroom. Um, and whether that's externships and how sort of industry and other professionals come in maybe to get more of an intellectual sense of the issues, um, but also bring a sort of um, pragmatic uh, sense uh, to the students and um, show them how sort of the equity and justice issues also that Jesse talked about um, play into the things that they're learning in the classroom. So I'm, I'm excited to have this discussion. Well, thanks both. Uh, so, um, yeah, let me start saying that uh, when, when I first saw the announcement last spring that Jesse was joining Tulane, I, I was very excited given 
you know, his background that I think is, is going to bring a lot of new and, and necessary things to our institution. And I think your presentation also really showed that I'm very pleased to see your, you know, all these initiatives that you're putting on the table. So maybe before I go on, you know, I've written down a few notes, but I, I want to make sure first that I'm not being off the mark in any kind of way. Uh, so maybe Jesse, you can answer a question first. And that is, uh, you know, to what extent this vision that you lay out, is that really focused on the architecture program versus basically the entire university at large? So when you talk about a climate core, I mean, it's easy to see, and, and you've made a compelling case how that's essential going forward for, you know, to educate future uh, architecture students. Uh, but of course, and I'm sure you won't disagree with me that it's essential much more broadly for, you know, there's, as you pointed out at the beginning, the demand for people with background in this very large area is is going to increase exponentially in the not so distant future. In fact, it's already happening. Um, so the, you know, the curricular ideas you laid out, are they intended specifically for architecture students or do you see that as something more broadly? No, and thank you for that question. <clears throat> in a way I would, I would dovetail it into, I think uh, Mark's quite astute commentary as to the challenge of uh, taking on so much, of course, and then balancing uh, the uh, emergent nature of materials into um, references, into texts, into truly translational materials. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is because when I was thinking this through, at least for this presentation, uh, you outed me a little bit here, because I actually see this as, a, as an undergraduate uh, core curriculum um, that could be extended to the entirety of the university, because I think many of these things uh, apply. Certainly, there's a certain analytical impetus that is aligned with the art and science of the built environment that uh, may be more or less appealing uh, within the various representative degree programs. Uh, but I think, you know, whether it's a core curriculum in terms of individual courses or sequenced courses, uh, I certainly see this as having much broader uh, application to a, a wide variety of majors. Um, but as Mark highlighted, you know, that's easier said than done for a lot, a lot of different reasons. Primarily, uh, there's no definitive foundation within the academy from which we can adjudicate quality control <laughs> and, 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 and synthesizing these things, which are often changing in real time. I mean, really the rate of change is phenomenal. So I'll stop there. I don't wanna preempt your commentary. Um, but yes, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, something that I, I could very easily envision to translate uh, to broad realm of undergraduates. Yeah, well, that's that's good to know, and I I, I kind of suspected that, but I just wanted to make sure. And uh, so, this is something I've you know also thought about for uh, for a while within uh, you know within the Tulane context and. Um, you know, my thinking being that what we really need is, um, you know, we, we need to <clears throat> move towards uh, a, a new major that is really focused on these types of issues that you talk about. And, uh, you know, I think this is something that is happening uh, elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's still in early stages. Uh, you know, how that this can take shape is, you know, it's going to depend. And, and, you know, as an institution, we should be thinking about how we can maybe, you know, add some, some relatively unique elements that are, are you know, some particular strengths that we have. Um, a couple of thoughts I have about this is that, you know, this would be an interdisciplinary program, obviously that would require uh, participation from 
probably most of our schools. And, and that, of course, is also the, the big appeal. Um, maybe there is one concern I have, and this is maybe not something that, that is often discussed, but um, I've, you know, over the years, because of course, interdisciplinary programs have been around for a long time. And the biggest uh, potential problem that I, I have seen with these types of programs is that the students, they tend to take classes in you know, different schools, different departments, and that's all fine. The problem is that they tend often not to have a real, like an academic home like in their own community. And, and that I think is something, and I, I don't have a clear answer to how we can get around it, but I think it's something we need to think about. Um, you know, from that point, th this also relates to my initial question, because if, if you think about uh, a climate core within the context of the School of Architecture, for example, uh, well, then, you know, you can, you probably can get around that issue because you're focused on primarily architecture students and they are there, they know each other, they know the faculty, et cetera. And this is kind of an added element. Uh, but if you think about something more broadly, then uh, yeah, you get students who, you know, they take a class here, they take a class there. They tend to have a harder time to get to know faculty members. It, it often makes it harder to get involved in things like research projects. Uh, and, and the way it often plays out is by the time they graduate, they have a hard time getting letters of recommendation from anyone because nobody really knows them. I mean, they, there's a lot of people who may know them a little bit. And I mean, it may sound like kind of a trivial thing. No, I, I think it's it important. Is important. I, I think one thing that, to gets to this point in a way in a slightly different framing is that what how do you define their competency right um, in these interdisciplinary terms um, the, the you know because these are non accredited programs and historically um, you know adjudicating uh, meritorious activity and research and scholarship and, and is very difficult and this is true for the faculty as well right this is the undercurrent um, that shapes the limitations of what uh, um, particularly what Mark and I do as interdisciplinary and transdisciplinarians uh, in many ways. Uh, so I, I hear you, and I think that is a fundamental limitation, uh, both as a socialization measure, but also really as a formal uh, measure of what it is that we're teaching people. Well, um, Jesse, I think you're, I mean, it's just an amazingly ambitious project, and maybe to, to piggyback on uh, what I think I hear from Tor is, you know, do you, the outcomes, do you want sort of a new type of professional coming out of this that goes into industry in this multidisciplinary way that can operate at various scales? Or do you want to whet the appetite and get a sort of basic level of knowledge so that people go on, let's say, as researchers or in let's say that if it was a minor in their major um, to to incorporate some of these ideals because I, I I could see it you know in in both directions. Yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful question, and I, I I've thought a lot about this, and ultimately I come down on the side that we're trying to mainstream this into conventional majors. I don't think there's a this is about supplanting a curriculum. I think this is only complementary. Uh, to a curriculum. I think that we there's constantly a rejiggering of general education within an accredited programs uh, and balancing different uh, external electives and, and the like. But I, I, to your question, Mark, and it's a fundamental question to the whole exercise, I, I, I see this as a means to support what they're learning in their core majors. And then and maybe to Tor's part, uh, po um, argument here on some level, is maybe this is best in a minor situation, right? Uh, where you can take a little bit more time, get a minor or the like. But I, I really see this as not standing on its own. Uh, 
I think things change too much. There's not enough substantive content. Not, I mean, talking about mobility and transportation, you get like a week, two classes in that, right? So it's about issue awareness and literacy. We're not, um, we're not, we're not developing a, a core level of um, um, competency independent. We're trying to develop a broader professional competency that's inclusive of these uh, measures of literacy. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right, both of you, and and thanks, Mark, for uh, you know maybe guiding me away from that idea that that I started off with, like you know this should be you know a major of the of the future, and you know maybe it will be, but I agree that it's probably the best path forward is to you know kind of build this step by step and. Um, you know, if you would design a, some kind of climate change minor that is, is relevant to, and, you know, it's easy to see how that's going to be relevant to a wide range of, uh, of majors, uh, you know, that's, that's maybe the way to, uh, to focus it, at least in the, in the near term. And that then, of course, would also kind of get you around that problem that I, uh, uh, thought about. Um, so, um, you know, one other thing, and, and this is more Tulane specific, that, uh, uh, you know, some areas that, that are maybe low hanging fruit is, uh, uh, well, you mentioned, for example, uh, you know, our public health program, which could play, uh, could definitely play a role in this. Uh, which you know may be something that is a little bit you know it's not necessarily available everywhere else, and the one thing where I think Tulane definitely has uh, something different is our our commitment to service learning, where you know anything around climate change is is it, it's so easy to see how that can be uh, brought into you know the most obvious. Uh, activity would simply be something in the area of educating the public, uh, you know, whether it's schools at different levels or, or you know, uh, other forms of, of, you know, public education by our students where they can basically apply their knowledge. Uh, but of course, there's many other uh, directions that that you could think of and I, I no, think I, I think that's very interesting and I think in part in part of the argument I make here is that you know you have to train people to operate within multi and interdisciplinary teams this is the future of work this is the future of work and or and from an organizational point of view you name it and I think that what you're getting at tour is really interesting because you know could service learning engage groups of people, not through education, but truly in bilateral terms in productive means. So that we're providing not only education, but that service is creating continuity to those relationships. Because this has always been my challenge to universities who've done these things. And I know Tulane defined the field and I don't, I don't want to critique that, but I think that one of the limitations is time and, and how you commit yourself over a certain amount of time to build these relationships and to build that social capital. And I think that in many ways, climate change is a wonderful means of engagement um, because it has very practical orientations to household economy and individual decision-making and risk perception and so many things um, that are critically important. So I, I, I hear you. And I think in, in speaking to Mark's prior commentary, you know, we don't have the canonical text Right. In, in some places we sort of do, in some places we don't. But a lot of this is teaching through case study, is teaching through precedent, is teaching in iterative modes from which actually design is quite well suited. Studio models are quite well suited for, inter, uh, for teamwork, uh, of course. But I think we're actually in a very, I think we have all the tools. I think we have all the pieces. And I think fundamentally it's about how we prioritize. And, and a big part of prioritization is not only getting buy-in from students, but buy-in from faculty and finding a role for faculty and their expertise to participate in this and, and including in this development of case studies in the development of the curriculum itself. Um, because if it's just one or two faculty, it'll live and die when those people come and go.
Um, and I think getting buy-in from the faculty itself is probably the most important uh, component of it moving forward. Um, you know, I see um, there, there was a question that I was actually going to get to in, in the chat about, right, our architecture degrees in particular are, right, very sort of set, right, end carb and sort of what you have to take. And, and I see that, you know, at, at Michigan, you know, we have um, a system studio that is also a housing studio, which makes the system studio actually extra hard, right? Because the students are, you know, doing that work to think about like plumbing risers and egress and all of these other things while they're also doing a housing studio that focuses in the last couple of years on Detroit and on some of the specific issues around that place. And so I, I see a dilemma, um, you know, in, cause I would love to see something like what you're talking about incorporated into the architecture studio, but I think it also then has to fit into the other requirements that are already happening. And I see the, the triumphs in certain degrees, but also the struggles of sort of being additive onto existing curriculum and, and fit in new curriculum. And I think you're right that you really need the buy-in, not only of the school, but of, of the faculty teaching it. Yeah, and I, I'm just now seeing Scott's question here. And I, I it's, it's central to the expansion or contraction of all curriculum. Uh, and, and to much, you know, how much of an overload and how much capacity do we really have? Well, frankly, we have very little capacity. Uh, and so the extent to which you can, again, mainstream it in, I, I tend to think that studios are not always the optimal way. I think there's a lot of content here that's, um, that requires some lecture and seminar-based formatting. But again, if this is to be truly mainstream, then you don't have that opportunity for seminars. It, it, it becomes pigeonholed into a lecture format. So there's a lot of trade-offs, there's very limited capacity. And so, and the question is, how do we rethink all of our curriculum in this light? And, and that become, can become overwhelming and, and totalizing and perhaps unproductive in a way. Thank you for looking at that chat, uh, Jesse and, and Mark. So I think we've covered, there's, there's one, one question that uh, says, you know, the Roland, Roland question, you want to answer? Uh, Roland, uh, I'm just going to read this out loud for uh, uh, in case everybody can't read it. Uh, as those least equipped to combat climate change are those that least contributed to it, how do you think climate change could change the financing aspect of real estate and emerging economies? You know, I'm going to leave that aside for a, a second. I, I think it fundamentally gets to parity. Uh, between consumers and producers and a certain uh, culp uh, moral, uh, I would argue, responsibility uh, between that parity in the sense that, and this is true not just in climate, but in broader notions or notations of environmental justice about uh, 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 um, impact and your own footprint in the world and the dis extreme disproportionate nature of that. And I think that in many ways, um, you know, how that plays out in financing is really a whole separate conversation, but it, I think your question is important because it shows us that financing and economics, and you don't have to be a finance major, you don't have to be an economics major to understand the basic influences of economy and capital that are part of the conversation. So I think the question is an appropriate one um, because it, it, it intrinsically forces us to give recognition to these trade-offs and a certain level of responsibility that's inherent in the accountability of design. Uh, so another, uh, Alex is raising a question about um, how do you propose that we maintain, uh, you know, who's someone who's graduating, how do we propose that we educate ourselves in these crucial topics and, and, and sort of navigate this in professional terms? Um, I don't want to speak uh, for anything other than, let's say, the AIA, but I think there's really great uh, continuing education, um, particularly at the AIA. Um, some of our colleagues actually, I think, are here uh, joining us tonight uh, who have done uh, really thought about these uh, avenues of mitigation, resilience, and adaptation in the curriculum. And I think across all professional membership organizations and societies, you're seeing better and better continuing education. Um, in, in this realm, but it's, it's difficult to keep up. And I think it may, you have to have maintain a sort of active stance 
and in this. But in many ways, this is the value of education. And, and people have said this forever. And we're not teaching you what you're going to need. We're going to teach you how to learn, right? When you go to the real estate models that we're teaching you, they're going to be obsolete in 10 or 15 years. We're teaching you how to utilize the instruments and the instrumentality of it in either professional or other structural ways that uh, will have be the language of innovation in the future. So I, it's a difficult question, but uh, an important one. Yeah, maybe I, I can follow up on that, uh, Jesse, because, uh, you know, this is, you know, I, I, I teach an intro course in global climate change, which is, you know, basically a climate science class for the most part. And I obviously face the same issue that, and I tell my students, like, look, you know, I try to cover the state of the art, but a lot will change pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I try to prepare them for, because, you know, most of them are going to go on and do different things. Um, you know, I try to bring them to a point that they're, you know, climate literate citizens that have the capability of, you know, staying up to date with, with this information that, you know, they have the foundation to uh, move forward. And the ways I I do it is, uh, uh, for example, by uh, uh, encouraging them to follow, uh, you know, sites like Climate Central, which is, uh, you know, a nonprofit that provides incredibly high quality information uh, that is provided by, uh, you know, people who are actively involved in research, but their main purpose is really public outreach. And, you know, places like that are, you know, the kinds of places where, you know, if, if you want to, and you don't have to spend a whole lot of time on it, you know, it's a good way to, you know, stay up to speed because, you know, I teach RCPs, uh, which Jesse knows exactly what that is. And, uh, but, Probably ten years from now, nobody talks about the RCPs anymore. Right. Actually, earlier than that. So. Right. But you know, the it's exactly what you're saying. You have to give them the foundation that they can become, to use a cliche, lifelong learners. Basically, it's literacy. I think all yeah. I, I don't want architects and real estate developers and the like. They're not. We don't ask them to be scientists. We just want them to be literate. And I think that's where we should maybe come together in some measure and maybe that's just seminars maybe it's maybe it's not as intensive as what i propose but i think we can we should all hold ourselves to a basic level of literacy i i have a question um i should be i guess taking the questions up from the chat but i have a question in relation to um, the, the, where, where in the curriculum is represented somehow the area of, of history of, of different ways of inhabiting the city, you know, the urban model. So are we assuming that we are in an urban model that will be challenged, but not radically uh, changed? So are we saying, I, I wonder if that, that, that I, if the, the part of history and culture might be missing in that framework in the sense of alternative pre-industrial models of inhabiting a region or uh, in, you know, people that are out, out of the grid, uh, is that an option and how half of the grid, half out, half in, are those considerations that needs to be taken in account in that climate change uh, sequence? Yeah, and, and I wasn't explicit about urbanization or urban studies as an independent, well, let's say coupled field within uh, Global Change 2 or People uh, curriculum, uh, but it, it's a perfect, you've identified a, a very clear gap in the nomenclature. As I had understood it in my mind, you know, starting with urban ecology and planetary urbanism and then moving into sustainability and urban consumption, was an, as a means to provide scale, but also an empirical foundation. 
And that it doesn't mean that history and historical and sociological aspects of urban urban studies as well as you know, architectural discourses aren't critically important in that. And I, I feel like we probably do a great job elsewhere, of course, but here I wanted to impose a certain finite orientation to measurement, measurement science um, within uh, urban consumption uh, and understanding that again, re reversing the scale, getting into globalization and alternatives to growth. Um, so I, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's the kind of process side of urbanization that I think is mo that is most, has the highest sort of utility in terms of education, but I, I could be totally wrong. And that, and that is probably, I think you, you asked the right question because it exposes my own limitations uh, as well in this thinking. And, and certainly um, it's just a starting point, of course. We have more questions, uh, Cosmal, uh, that says expand on your thoughts to integrate into existing regulated licenses. Someone will be held liable. Yes, yes, and I, a, I, it's, a good, it's a very good question. And in many ways, it's what's driving all of this, right? It's mm -hmm. the fact that um, we can talk about literacy all we want, but at the end of the day, we're actually talking about a standard of care. And that's true for tour school, it's true for mark school, it's true for how we think about risk management and professional liability, how we think about nature of negligence. Uh, Rachel Minery from the National uh, AIA is here tonight. Um, Rachel, who has led uh, climate change at the AIA uh, for many years in distinguished terms, she's doing it because her members have economic in incentives. It's, this is not just a moral argument that we're making. Um, licensure uh, is going to have to respond sooner than later. Uh, in understanding uh, and distilling what um, Tor previously identified as a challenge about um, the adjudication of competencies and what are the minimal levels of competency um, that we would hold ourselves to. Uh, and I, you know, I, there's all kinds of tools and instruments now, particularly in analysis and carbon footprinting and just carbon equivalent orientations to material material selection that is now accessible really to all architects and architects or students. Let's start there. That can be a core competency. Do you know how to use this? What is the trans, you know, what is the unit of science and how does that translate to practice? It's all there. Uh, and there are many people, even among a, a, a number of participants who join us here tonight who have contributed to this dialogue for many years. So I think um, uh, that is what's driving this. It's not a, uh, this, we're not just a bunch of do-gooders. Uh, some of us may be. I consider myself not a do-gooder, uh, but we're doing this because economies and labor markets and ultimately professional licensure is driving this. Is there another question that I might have overlooked here? There is a question from Rebecca Snedeker that oh, I think Rebecca. is a really interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, live, research and live together. Yeah, it's interesting. So I brought up the idea of, and maybe this is not a direct answer to your question uh, Rebecca brings up, but the idea of consensus and consensus building. Um, there's, uh, of course, a very famous consensus building institute uh, drawn from work from a professor at MIT, um, which actually does a lot of work in climate these days. But these are skills. I mean, I, I think a lot of times in the realm of, and again, I'm preaching to the choir on this because Tulane sort of pioneered this whole model practice and participatory design and community engagement. But I think that there are elements of consensus that um, translate in and outside of design that are truly skills based. It's not just negotiation or the uh, uh, transfer of power and authority in a transactional sense. There are truly important skills there about uh, organization, social organization consensus that I think we can teach. Um, so that's, uh, it's, a good, it's a very good question. There's no answer, of course, but I think that it leads us into a certain direction. I and really again, um, like oh, um, Cassius's question about, um, you know, is, is, it, is this also a policy related matter? Um, and I think about, you know, things like the role of insurance companies, the role of, you know, federal incentives that, 
actually maybe um, create uh, bigger hazards um, and you know how that fits in. So I, one of the things I liked about your presentation, Jesse, was that you need all of these different elements because sometimes if you just have the scientific element, then right, you, you, you're solving a problem, but you're not necessarily bringing in the moral or ethical dimensions, right? Like we'll just make the house, right? 30 feet, you know, uh, above, you know, the, the high tide line and that'll solve our problem rather than like, should, should we be doing that? Right. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I read this article, which was a surprise to me, like, plastic isn't recyclable, but we put the re recycling symbol on it, right? Because of lobbying and, you know, um, a certain scientific uh, in parameter that was put on it. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, mm -hmm. let's, let's not, let's, that's a good excuse to stop using plastic because now we all think these things are recyclable that aren't recyclable. So I think, you know, the, the, the policy, understanding the policy mechanisms, but also understanding that Policy many times is, uh, you know, equal to to the science um, is, is important. So I, I was appreciative of Cassius's question. Yeah, and, and Cash is a distinguished professor here at Tulane, also a University of Michigan graduate as well. So uh, uh, that's why he's asking <laughs> such good questions. But you know, uh, you know, part of that I think that just explicit in his question is like, isn't a price on carbon? A heuristic to internalize these costs, whether you know about climate change or not, and that's the kind of ease of a carbon price, right? Um, but I still, I think, again, reinforcing exactly what you said, Mark, is like a lot of times we tend to think about material and building code, for instance, in buildings, without fundamentally asking the question or uh, addressing the underlying analysis as to the under ex existential nature from which land, site, context fundamentally define uh, at least the long-term performance within the remaining useful life of the structure itself. So it's a fundamental question um, that I think has an analytical import, but certainly an ethical one as well. Okay, so it looks like we're arriving to the end. I don't know if you want to take uh, another question from the chat before we wrap up. Uh, where, where am I missing it? Is any, anybody I haven't really gotten to? Uh, Wellington, one more from Wellington, the required integration of expertise in sectors calls into question the long-standing framework of most universities around disciplines. Uh, is that implied in your proposal given the urgency of the issue? I actually, um, I can't give you an honest answer about that because I have my own uh, incentives uh, for disciplinarity that reward uh, how I get a paycheck. But I can tell you that uh, the disciplinarity, um, we can think about disciplinarity as solving problems and solutions, or we can think about it in driving discursive natures of knowledge. And I think ultimately we have to prioritize and balance all of the nature of truth and knowledge in favor of not just application and utility, because that becomes too derivative of a shortcut for reinforcing existing incentives and disincentives in the world that don't do us much good, because we just rehash uh, a world from which we are trained and operate in. And we need new knowledge. Uh, and the only way we can get to new knowledge is often through the discipline imposed by disciplinarity. But at the same time, we have to recognize that it has done us a disservice to the extent that it itself is a set of institutions uh, that are rigid and that can lock us in into quite maladaptive outcomes. So it's a it's, a, it's not an easy binary outcome associated with disciplinarity, but it's a fundamentally important question about how uh, we make investments in our own education. So thank you and really thank you to our respondents and to Margarita and everyone for taking the time tonight. Yeah, thank, thank you all of you, Tor, Mark and Jesse. And uh, we, we are closing now. So it's, in, it's, it's interesting to think that this conversation will continue across corridors, across Zooms, et cetera because it's almost a, a, a proposal and a, and a provocation, I guess, for all us, of us to, to think about in the coming, the coming years or months. So thank you so much for coming, all participants, 49, and, and the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Take care, everybody. Be well. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.